This is a 12 volt cool box made by Halfords. Well, branded by Halfords, made by someone else. And this is also a 12 volt cool box made by a brand I'm not even going to try and say. They do the same thing. However, internally, they share basically no components. Intrigued? So am I. Let's go deep diving. Keeping things cool has been important since, well, forever. And as soon as we found a way to do this in a portable format, we started making these things, or variants of them. The smaller, blue Halfords branded item contains a thermoelectric module, or TEC as they're often referred to, a device that moves heat from one side to the other using the Peltier effect. This is named after French physicist Jean Charles, I'm not going to try and say that, Peltier, who discovered it in 1834. He found out that when current is made to flow through a junction between two conductors, heat will be generated or removed at the junction. Fascinatingly, if you apply a heat differential to a thermoelectric module, it will generate electricity. Rather than cooling, some of the first applications of these curious devices were actually powering small appliances such as radios from a heat source. Soviet-era Beta-M generators were another application. A core of strontium-90 provided heat via radioactive decay, directly coupled to a thermoelectric module and capable of producing around 10 watts of electricity. You heard that correctly. This huge thing, weighing in at over half a ton, produces just enough power to illuminate a small lamp. These were used to power beacons and lighthouses in very remote locations. However, since the Soviet Union was dissolved in 1991, they've largely been abandoned, leading to a few incidents where scrap metal scavengers have fallen foul of the radioactive materials within. Thermoelectric modules have only been used in small refrigeration applications since the 1960s, with widespread popularity due to lower costs leading to a boom in the 90s and noughties. Everyone had a mini fridge, an obnoxiously loud, sometimes brashly coloured piece of plastic that proudly held six cans and made them sort of cold at a push, such as this Micromark microcooler. I had one of these, and it was fairly terrible. Over time these have evolved into what I have here, a 12.5 litre 12 volt powered cool box. Delightfully simple with no controls, on the tin this looks like a fairly decent bit of kit, proudly boasting that it can hold 17 standard cans of fizzy drink, or soda if you're across the water. Weighing in at a svelte 3.6 kilos, it's easy to lug around with a large built in handle and even a neat little pocket to store the power cable. Most of these coolers advertise that they cool to between 20 and 25 degrees below ambient or similar. This is because they're directly limited by the temperature of the side of the TEC shedding heat to the outside world. What this means is that if you use this in a car without AC on a hot day, you know, when you might really want a cold drink, this thing is really going to struggle. Recently though, a new breed of portable drinks chiller has emerged. The compressor variety, as they seem to be marketed. While purporting to do the same job, it uses vapour compression refrigeration, the same technology used in your home refrigerator. There's a reason thermoelectric modules aren't used much outside of very niche applications. They're incredibly inefficient, with a coefficient of performance, which is a measure of system efficiency, around four to five times worse than a vapour compression system. The theoretical maximum COP for a thermoelectric module using today's technology is around 0.7. That means for every 70 watts of cooling, it's going to take 100 watts of power input, and then you have the whole 170 watts to get rid of on the hot side. Vapor compression systems, thanks to the power of latent heat and a whole load of magic tomfoolery I won't go into, can have a COP of 4 or more meaning that 100 watts of input power could in theory net you 400 watts of cooling. A fair old difference. An order of magnitude bigger than the Halfords cool box, and able to hold around 55 drinks cans, it's also a fair bit more expensive. I paid around £120, but the listing's since been taken down. 
This is as close as I can find now, although the one I have in front of me has a capacity of around 40 litres, so it's a fair bit bigger. Featuring a full refrigeration loop, including teeny tiny compressor and a whole 17 grams of R600A refrigerant, this 15 kilo heavyweight gets the job done with a sound level around half of that of the Halfords item, even though there's both a fan and compressor working away in there. If the larger cooler is blatantly better, why would I compare them, you may ask? Well, a YouTube channel I follow, Technology Connections, posted a video comparing a mains powered thermoelectric cooler to various traditional fridges. Alec went into a great level of detail on how both systems work, I'll post a link to this video in the description below, it's well worth a watch if you're into this kind of thing, and the rest of the content on his channel is absolutely brilliant in my opinion. The question I have is while the energy efficiency is undoubtedly much better in a traditional fridge, is there a use case for these where power consumption doesn't matter as much? Let's face it, in a car, van or truck, it doesn't really matter if it uses a bit more juice. The real world effect on fuel economy will be absolutely negligible. We'll start by seeing how much power each type uses in a head to head test, keeping the thermal load similar by filling each with 6 room temperature cans of 7up and popping a thermal probe in amongst them as you can see here. No expense spared, I've used only the finest aquarium thermometers. In their defence, the baseline readings before powering each unit on are actually very close. Please also excuse the DJI box I mounted them both to, it absolutely does not contain the drone I promised my wife I wouldn't buy. Here's a quick power draw comparison before I start the main test. The Halford unit pulls just over 4 amps which barely changes as time goes on. The compressor cooler starts at pretty much zero as it powers up the electronics. Once the compressor itself spins up, the power draw is stable at half that of the Halford's cool box for 2-3 minutes, but off camera rose to a peak of around 3.5 amps. Once down to the set point, the compressor cuts in and out to maintain temperature, whereas the Halford's item, like with most thermoelectric coolers, will sit pulling that 4 amps forever if you let it. Here's some time lapse footage I took over the course of 3 hours, showing how much the compressor will cut in and out when set to 3 degrees in an ambient temperature of around 18 degrees. You can see it barely runs. Less power for 3 times the space. And not just to cool cans, this thing has a temperature control that goes all the way down to minus 20 degrees Celsius. While obviously a bad idea to do that while the 7 up in there, I did drop the temperature right down to transport several bags of ice for a party. It had no trouble holding an indicated minus 20 for several hours, and I can confirm the ice was the non-runny kind when I came to use it later that day. I'm using two power supplies for this test. One is a fixed 12 volt supply, I measured at 12.3 volts, the other is a variable unit I've set to exactly the same figure. One interesting problem I couldn't really account for is the fact the Halfords cooler has a fan inside the lid to circulate air internally. As expected, this pushes cool air between the cans early on and gives it a bit of a head start, on paper at least. Opening up a lead of well over a degree, I'm beginning to doubt my own judgement, but we all know that true heroes don't always emerge victorious immediately. Despite having no internal fan, the compressor cool is soon catching up, matching the Halfords item at the 23 minute mark and then absolutely steaming ahead, all while drawing less current than its competitor. I ended the test around the 2 hour mark, while the can showed a low of 1.8 degrees in the compressor cooler, the internal display reckoned it was actually minus 12 degrees in the box, and having a quick feel, I'm inclined to agree. All internal surfaces were covered with a thin layer of frost, as mentioned previously this unit has no internal fan, instead the cooling loops run throughout the interior of the unit itself. The test was fairly conclusive, 
Despite the room being a relatively cool 18 degrees Celsius, the thermoelectric cooler really struggled to keep up when the temperature inside the unit dropped, even when the differential was less than 10 degrees. While not important for sealed cans of drink, I don't need to tell you why keeping food that needs to be refrigerated at these temperatures is unsafe. These are only suitable for cooling drinks in my opinion, as food safety isn't something you want to mess about with. When the bottom has fallen out of your world because the world's falling out of your bottom, you'll wish you'd have listened. Next, let's take a look inside each item. Results on paper are cool, but I want to see what makes them tick. We'll start with the thermoelectric item. The screws are cleverly hidden under the foam seal, and once it had taken me a depressingly long time to work that out, I was in. This bad boy's seen a lot of use over the years, and it shows. We'll be giving that a good clean before it goes back together. Predictably, it's a very simple affair with no control circuitry whatsoever, just a TEC sandwiched between two heat sinks and airflow driven by a rather clever single motor dual wheel fan. Powering it up with the heat sink removed from the cold side, you can see the thermoelectric module starts working very quickly, dropping well below zero degrees in a matter of seconds. Apologies for the poor FLIR footage, for some reason the camera and thermal sensor are massively out of alignment in this shot. Before popping it back together, I used some new thermal paste on the TEC after giving both surfaces a clean, and also cleaned out the years of detritus that had been hidden away under the plastic covers. This is what's inside the compressor cooler. A full fridge in adorable Honey, I Shrunk the Refrigeration Cycle format. First we have the control circuitry, the tiny compressor, the wiring for the controls and power inlet, all of which are on the panel I removed to gain access, a 120mm 12 volt fan that looks suspiciously like something from a PC power supply, the condenser, and finally capillary tube connecting to the evaporator coil built into the walls of the cooler. It's a really neat system, and although I'm no expert, it looks like some effort has gone into the design and build of the cooling circuit. Finally, Although we know vapour compression cooling is vastly superior in most ways, especially in mains electricity powered applications, can we make a compelling case for the thermoelectric cooler in 12 volt flavour? I'm gonna surprise you all by saying yes. In certain situations, I can see where this would actually be a decent option. It goes without saying that all of those theoretical situations would need to be in an air conditioned vehicle or other cool environment. When the ambient air is warm, this thing just can't keep up. But consider this. The compressor cooler takes a little while to spin up the compressor, build system pressure and actually start cooling, whereas from the moment the first few electrons make their way into that TEC sandwich, heat is on the move. Sure, it's moving very inefficiently, but it's instant, and in some cases that's very useful. In a previous life, I used to deliver parcels, in the summertime I'd carry a few cans of Pepsi in the door pocket of my van, but invariably they'd get warm as the day progressed, which wasn't really the refreshment I was going for. Constant stopping and starting of the van's engine for deliveries would mean the compressor cooler would really struggle. The auxiliary power socket was only live when the engine was running. Conversely, the Halfords cooler wouldn't care about this one bit, it'd just get back to cooling as soon as the juice was flowing again. As for the noise, my battered Mercedes Sprinter wasn't a particularly quiet place to be, especially when a younger version of me loved nothing more than sharing my love of new metal with the world as I did my delivery round. Granted, this is a very niche use case, but it sprung straight to mind when thinking of the times this cooler would have been handy to own. The other obvious difference is size. While the cavernous compressor cooler is more useful for longer trips, it may be that a lightweight, easy to carry solution is better for some users and compressor coolers just aren't ever going to be as portable. You've got the compressor itself, the condenser, where the heat is shedded, the expansion valve, the capillary tube, the pipe work, and of course many cooling loops within the cooler itself, they all add up to a lot more than a 20 gram TEC, two small fans, and two aluminium heat sinks. The compressor cooler has a collapsible handle like a suitcase, and a set of rather large wheels to help it get around, a far cry from the simple plastic carry handle of its lightweight counterpart. A feature of some thermoelectric coolers you may find useful is the ability to heat instead of cool. Simply flip the polarity of the power fed to the TEC via a switch, 
and your cooler now works the other way around, holding a temperature of around 60 degrees Celsius in my tests. You're never going to cook in it, but if you have something you want to keep warm, it'll do the job perfectly fine. Another benefit specific to in-car or other portable applications is the fact thermoelectric coolers are completely solid state with no moving parts. Vapor compression systems rely on oil sitting in that black compressor housing to both keep it cool and provide lubrication. Have this anything other than upright and that oil is going to make its way into places it shouldn't and I don't need to tell you why that would be bad. It's why most fridge manufacturers tell you to let a newly unboxed unit stand for 24 hours before plugging it in. That oil needs to be in the compressor housing and nowhere else. You can throw the thermoelectric cooler on its side while running and it quite literally won't care. As long as the fan is left uncovered, it'll work just fine. I have to finish by giving a real world example of when the compressor cooler really got to stretch its legs and prove that the refrigeration cycle, even in a minutely small form, is incredibly powerful. As I'm a sucker for punishment, I often camp at car shows, sometimes in a tent, yuck, or in the back of my old BMW estate car if I'm feeling lazy, which is usually the case. There was around 10 of us in 30 degree heat, that's nearly 90 Fahrenheit to you freedom enthusiasts, but this is English heat where it's muggy and sticky rather than pleasantly dry. As you can imagine, an ice cold beer was a great antidote but given we were in a field without a pub for miles around and only had warm cans of Guinness, Moretti and other things that really aren't great at room temperature, we had to hope the cooler could assist. This thing absolutely kicked ass all weekend. In anticipation, I took a spare battery for the BMW with me and swapped them over periodically, running the car for half an hour to top it back up after I'd performed the change. As long as I kept on top of rotating the cans to newest at the bottom of the cooler, which became more difficult the more cans I emptied into my face, there was an endless supply of chilled beverages. I was amazed it could keep up the way it did, especially given how hot the weather was. Comparing the two side by side, there is one obvious winner, but when you take efficiency out of the equation, it goes some way to levelling the playing field, even if only by quite a small amount. I'd like to thank Alec of Technology Connections for his very interesting content on latent heat and the refrigeration cycle. I feel like saying that sentence will have set off an alarm in his studio. And also a big thank you to all of you for watching. Can you think of any other applications where thermoelectric cooling may have distinct benefits over a more traditional setup? Let me know in the comments below. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, take care and don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Cheers. Thank you.